Solitaire Rose Radio, Episode 55, an interview with artist, teacher, and all-around good guy, Paul Fricke. I have known Paul, in person that is, for I, I don't even know how long. I remember him coming to the Minneapolis convention. He said that he doesn't quite remember when it was. I remember real early him showing up with Len Straczewski and he was this... I, I knew him from Troll Lords. Troll Lords was a black and white comic that came out in the 80s that I remember picking up because it had an interesting blurb in in the what passed for previews at the time and was in, really impressed by it. I was impressed by the depth of the story, was impressed by the art, and was impressed by how it kept getting better and better and better. And by the time Paul came here, Troll Lords was moving toward its end and he was working at DC. And he's just a really fun, gregarious guy. And he's one of the people who at every convention I try to say hi to, we say hi to each other. Um, I always call the Minneapolis convention kind of a family reunion because it's a lot of the local artists, a lot of the local people like me who've been involved in the convention for years and years and years. And we see each other twice a year and we catch up and everything. And Paul asked if I wouldn't want to interview him. And it reminded me that we haven't actually sat down and had a good long conversation in quite a long time. We have a very wide-ranging conversation, not just about his career, but about other things that have gone on in his life and how he has moved into teaching as part of being an artist. And it's it's a really good interview. I, I hope you enjoy it. Well, the first thing I wanted to ask is when was the first um, Minnesota convention that you went to? You know, um, I've been... I've thought about that, and it it must have been close to the start of the of the of this con. Um, I recall in 1986, shortly after Trollords had debuted, a handful of Minnesotans came down to a mini con in Chicago. Uh, Paul Ewart and Peter Kraus, when they just started Entropy Tales, and uh, I, I'm guessing that we had a chat and ended up. You know, Scott and I drove up to do some kind of show. Now, I don't know if it was what became the Minnesota, you know, uh, the MSB Comic-Con now, um, but I recall coming up to do a show um, in the late 80s or early 90s. The first one was a one day at a VFW in 88, spring of 88. And then fall of 88 was the first um, two-day at the, the glorious Thunderbird. Yeah, and I don't know if I was at the very first one, or I remember coming up for some show, uh, but who knows if it was the late 80s or the early 90s. Um, and again, I, I, do, I remember doing one at a hotel. It wasn't the Thunderbird. Uh, I remember reading, uh, meeting Ralph Johnson there, um, who... Uh, owned the comic book college at the time. Okay, yeah. And um, and and then I know that you know we came up and did a, a show early on, but I, you know it probably was one of the first you know within the first five years of the show um, because by '93 I moved up here and I know I came up you know we we were already coming up for two or three years before that. So if I didn't make the first one or the second one or the third one, it, it, it was uh, it was early. I wanted to say that you like the convention so much you moved to the state. Well, it, 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 it ended up, I mean, there were a lot of things that brought us to Minnesota. We had not only the convention and, and uh, people up here, um, but we had friends out, uh, outside of comics and within comics that we knew and got along with very well. So uh, I, I recall distinctly that uh, – there was a DC party at a place called Bub City in Chicago, and my wife and I were looking for, you know, to move out of a townhome uh, near O'Hare. And Cindy Goff and Ralph uh, were talk were looking at a place up here, and we uh, compared notes. And I'm like, wait a second, 
<laughs> we're not looking in <laughs> Chicago anymore. There was like a 30 or 40 percent difference in the cost of housing. And I thought, and we were getting squeezed when we were looking in Chicago. And, uh, and you know, we had toyed with the idea of coming up here, but we, we thought after, you know, a visit up here with friends and we went, oh, we'll never do that. And uh, we talked about it for 20 or 30 minutes. And then uh, a couple years later, we moved up. Well, cool. And you said that you, you first kind of got to know people around here from Troll Lords. And I wanted to talk a little about Troll Lords. It came out during the black and white boom that came after Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's right. And there were bajillions of black and white comics, and it seemed like a lot of them were being published with people's lunch money. Yeah. But the people who sort of used that that black and white boom to get different ideas out, not to do what had come before, seemed to stay in the industry longer. And Troll Lords was nothing like any of those. I, if I remember right, the solicitation said something about it, the Three Stooges and death. Yeah, I think the uh, when Scott and I actually had begun doing Troll Lords drawings um, before Turtles came out. He he actually started Troll Lords as a – he was going to a community college in Chicago, and he started doing like a three-panel strip called Troll Lords, but it was just slapstick, and they, and they looked nothing like they do now, and I'm not sure what happened. And, and But we were already collaborating, and we had done, you know, two-pagers and four – eight-pagers, and I said, let's do a longer one. He goes, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he plugged this Troll Lords idea into a longer story. And so we developed that. Uh, and that story that we drew in 84 never saw print. But we took that around to a variety, uh, you know, to the convention in Chicago. And we showed, it was the days when you could walk right up to the DC table um, and show something to Archie Goodwin or Jim Shooter at the Marvel table. Um, and I didn't expect them to like it or say we'll publish it, but we could get feedback from just standing at the table, very casually. And I remember showing it to Dave Sim, and we, you know, we were already friends, and we had spent tons of times at his table in Chicago as, as fans. And he said, uh, "It's not professional, but try publishing it yourself." And we went, "Yeah, right," and walked away. And a few months later, I thought, "Hey, yeah, why don't we?" And and some of that had to do be, with the, the the in the meantime the turtles had come out. Now I picked up that first issue and I thought, uh, you know that's pretty funny. It's a cool parody. Uh, and, but when a second issue came out, I I, I I was surprised that it went beyond the parody. Um, but you know the the content itself didn't say didn't uh, lend itself to us saying. Hey, we'll do a, a turtle-like book. We already had the the Troll Lords was already you know developed or semi-developed, um, but it did give us the idea that hey, people can do this. You know, we had already been following the model of the self-publisher Jack Katz with First Kingdom, uh, uh, Wendy and Richard Peeney with ElfQuest, and then Dave Sim. And Sim was our our biggest model. He was very vocal about even in the earliest days. I think with issue 12, he said, I'm going to do 300 issues of this and finish it on such and such a date in 2004, and by God, he did it. Uh, but but just for someone to declare that and have that kind of long vision and make a commitment really, really, really got into our heads and, and the ownership of, of the material. So, you know, from that and, and seeing that people could put uh, stuff out on their own, uh, I started doing research, uh, bud plant um who was a distributor at the time, somehow I heard about and got like a, a few pages of how to self-publish and how to use the distribution system. This is before Dave Sim ever started doing in the back of his book, you know, how to self-publish, you know, the whole guide that he later collected. Uh, yeah. That, this predates that. <laughs> and because he did that sometime in the early to mid nineties. So, uh, already in 86, I got my hands on that Bud Plant thing, which was extremely helpful, and it showed us how those self-publishers uh, got it tapped into the uh, direct sales market and how the distribution system was set up. And, you know, I was 21 and thought, well, wh why not give it a shot? Before we're in debt or before we have, um, you know, other commitments or, or a life or a job or whatever, why not, why not take a flyer? And it it was one of the few that actually outlasted the boom. And you got picked up by 
by a number of of the distributors and stuff and you're coming up on a 30th anniversary but i want to go back before troll lords to <laughs> when when you started thinking about art oh yeah well when well, did you start drawing and i already know one of your artistic heroes but who were your artistic heroes <laughs> as you were learning how to draw uh you know i just always liked to draw as a kid and, and probably in the earliest days i just emulated my older brother in in most things he's like three and a half years older than me and he drew cartoons and comics so i started and he bought comics so i read them um but somewhere around the age of 12 uh, i just decided uh i'm gonna you know now i had already been drawing my own little mini comics myself coloring them and inking them up and showing them to friends uh, copying them and selling them for a quarter to friends and stuff like that. But when I was 12, I kind of just made a declaration to myself that uh, I'm going to be a comic book artist, and in 10 years I'm going to draw Spider-Man. And then I just started taking steps to do everything I could to make that happen. So uh, in high school, they ran, you know, I took every art class I could. I took, uh, they ran out of classes for me, so they created one-on-one -on -one um, you know, independent studies, one of which was drawing my own comic during one quarter or semester. Uh, I took printing classes. I took senior lit so I could learn how to write or uh, symbolism and all that kind of stuff and about story. Um, and I just tried to train myself to do exactly what I wanted to do. Um, you know, but at, at 22, I wasn't drawing Spider-Man, but uh, in a way, I think it was better how it went, it went uh, down. We uh, partnering with Scott, and then bringing Brian Augustin aboard, we were able to, uh, you know, kick off a career where we uh, created, wrote, drew, published, uh, and owned our own thing. And and once that you once that you get that under your belt, and once you have that experience it's really hard to let go of. <laughs> so uh, it did kind of, uh, doing the book, uh, we thought going into it, we would do, you know, and again, uh, Dave Sim talked about how what he published and, you know, how many numbers were his print run and all that kind of stuff. So we thought we'll do six issues if we can. We thought maybe we'd get orders for three to 5,000. We got orders for just under 10. The second issue sold 40,000. Uh, wow. We did a reprint of the first issue and that sold 45,000 and you know, uh, we we did take a loan from a a friend's father to pay for that initial print run and we had a we wanted to pay him back right away and uh we and you know, early and we couldn't because we needed the funds to keep printing more books. So, you know, when you talked about that black and white boom, we were I think on the on the early edge of it, meaning I don't recall many other books uh, during that, uh, you know, ours was what, January or February of 86. So maybe Fish Police beat us by three or six months. Maybe Elf Lord came out around the same time. There weren't many. We were on the early edge of it. Now, if we waited a few months, then books like Samurai Penguin or Adolescent Black Belt, whatever, Hamsters, <laughs> they came out a few months <laughs> later than us like six months later, and they were printing 60 and 70,000 copies or more. So um, what, we always went into it thinking, uh, you know, let's see how this goes. If it doesn't go great, we'll at least have a few issues to show to, pu to publishers or editors and, and, and have it for a portfolio. And if it does, let's write it. Um, and and uh, we try to set ourselves up. Uh, for the long haul, and we tried to set ourselves up to be serious about it. So the first, you know, year we did six issues bi-monthly, and then with the seventh issue, we cut our page count uh, so uh, to go monthly. We started uh, hiring people to do uh, Troll Lords backups, like seven-page uh, stories. Uh, so, and then we did a color book too, um, Jerry's Big Fun Book. So uh, we were we were pretty serious about it. We went to trade shows and went to the diamond trade show, and we met a lot of people uh, in the industry. And you know, you never know with those little um, those little moments. You know, I, I remember talking to Diana Schutz for just a few minutes at that trade show in '87, 
Uh, a year later, I recall uh, having drinks with Bob Shrek, uh, you know, till four in the morning uh, at a, at, at a Mid Ohio show, and he was asking, you know, what's it like? How's how's it going? And I was like, you know, I'm kind of tired of self-publishing and dealing with the business part of it and distribution and getting a lawyer to make sure they pay and write in solicitations. I just want to draw it. And a year later, uh, as that, you know, the boom turned to a bust and we were writing it out, the numbers continued to come down, but we were still making a living, but it was getting harder. And, uh, and then Shrek called out of the blue and said, Kimiko is expanding its line. We want you aboard. So, uh, you know, they they imploded within a year or two right after that. Um, so we only put four issues out from there. And, but when that fizzled, uh, Apple called us and said, hey, let's extend this. And we did six more issues with them. So, uh, you know, it was quite a ride. And, but even during that time, like in 87, 88, I already started doing side jobs, lettering and inking for first comics and DC comics. Um, and so by the time we were winding up Troll Lords uh, for you know almost 30 issues from like 86 to 91, I'd say, with different publishers, um, I was already, I was ready to go into full-time inking for DC uh, right around that time. So it, it, it launched careers and, uh, and uh, it's, it's hard to believe now looking back on it that it's a, uh, that that's 30 years now. Crazy. One of the things that comes out as you tell the story is there were a lot of little self-publishing people around the time, and there were some big, you know, there were some big names who were self-publishing who all kind of flamed out. But as you told the story, you kept saying about, you know, we had this plan, we had this plan, we had this plan. You had backup plans in place. You thought of it as a business and not art. Well, it's a capital A. I, I would say when we initially got into it, we did think of it as art. We took comics very seriously, and we were we wanted to reach our audience. I would say I became a, an entrepreneur as uh, just by the experience. We we the, the publishing self publishing thing and the business part of it was a means to an end for us, and it was art. But Brian kept telling us, and he was right, that you know it's still just comics. And the first thing you do is entertain, and then we'll see how things go. You know, you entertain, people connect with the characters, we'll, we'll see how sales go, uh, and we'll go from there. And, you know, and that series, you know, um, let him show his stuff. And before we were even done with the True Studios run, he was snapped up to edit at DC Comics, and then Len Straszewski stepped in to do, uh, you know, the rest. He worked with us as an editor and collaborator for the rest of the run. Um, but yes, the, along the line, uh, we had to become serious about the business end of it uh, and did try to take that part of it uh, seriously. So, uh, uh, but you know, um, the market does determine that stuff. I would say that with Trollards, our timing was good. Um, I, I'd like to think that the, the, the work holds up or, or most of it. I look back on it now and I cringe at some of those pages because, you know, we were learning on the job. Um, but some of it holds up pretty well as I'm reading it. And and uh, the thing is, uh, you were talking about the turtles. There were obviously many books at the time that came out that were just parodies of a parody. They were just cashing in on the, on the turtles thing. Um, and sometimes we did, I heard through fans or at conventions that we did get mixed up in that, meaning, you know, uh, you got four little green turtles whose best friend is a, is a young lady, and we got three little green trolls whose best friend is a young lady. And, and if you look at the surface elements, there are, uh, there are some similarities. And, and we were black and white, and we started around the same time and, and, and uh, so on. And a couple of people have, you know, intimated to me, I won't name names now, but they did say to me over the years, oh, you were riding that turtle thing. And I was like, whoa, whoa, hey, what? <laughs> In fact, the turtle guys were fans. There's a, Peter Laird uh, did a Troll Lords pinup. He sent, sent it to us early on in the run, and we ran that in issue three or four or two. I can't recall. It was pr fairly early. Um, and they did a, they started a, a book called Turtle Soup where they had other people draw the turtles. And, yep. and in the foreword, they say, 
we got the idea from the Trollards guys when they started letting other people draw them for their backups. So I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, our, the way Brian described uh, Trollords was it's a slapstick comedy adventure about love, life, and death. And, yep, and I remember that. And I thought it was, he goes, that's the closest, that's the most succinct I can get it. And, uh, and it was a weird, uh, it was a weird melange of, uh, of, of, uh, genres and, and tone. You know, we, uh, a lot of the best stuff that I liked watching in terms of movie and movies and TV, you think of MASH, you think of other other stuff during that time we wanted to mix comedy and drama and for some reason we we didn't think it strange that these three stooge like characters were also operating as magical you know guardian angels and helping people and we dealt with extremely serious topics so even though it looked like a uh, a kid friendly fantasy book we dealt with suicide in the first three issues. <laughs> we dealt with alcoholism yeah. in issues seven and eight. Uh, we, we uh, you know, we dealt with a lot of topics, serial killers. <laughs> we didn't put a, a label on it. There was no mature nothing. Seven-year-olds would write in how much they loved Trollards and, and draw us, you know, we had color contests in the back of the book and it was a fun ride. And uh, so, you know, currently what we're trying to do, um, getting close to, uh, getting all of that, uh, the first batch of the early material uh, scanned. Some of that is a difficult task because it was a black and white book and there's a lot of Zipatone all over it. And I think most of your listeners probably will remember what Zipatone is. But, um, you know, I, I cut all those sheets on there and, and some of those uh, patterns are tight and they don't scan well. So there's some post-production that has to be done. But right now the the, the, the plan is, and I'm getting close to finishing it, is that there's about 700 pages of Trollords material that we did over that period of time. The first, uh, you know, the first 15 issues that we did as True Studios was is about, I don't know, just about 400, 450 pages. So uh, we, we're trying to put everything together. So this year, during the 30th anniversary in the second half of the year, probably in June or July, we'll release uh, a uh, different volumes of. Uh, digital material of the earliest uh, Trollords material and then follow up with subsequent volumes. Once those are out, then we'll start considering print. We have offers to, to get this stuff back in print, whether that would be, you know, a, a gigantic omnibus with everything or a two volume thing or a five volume thing, I don't know. Um, but once we get the digital volumes out, we'll start gauging reaction and uh, and see if we, we can you know, get this uh, material that was done a while ago now for us um, um, available again for, you know, the stalwarts and the, the longtime fans and see if we can uh, in, intrigue new fans to uh, to check out the, the material. I, I, again, that was uh, Dave Sims' uh, idea was do the work, own it, and keep it in print. <laughs> and, uh, yep. and, and we haven't done that uh, because, you know, we've been living life and doing other work and so on, but... Uh, uh, that's one of the things we're trying to do is uh, is get the material uh, all prepared and ready for uh, to, for re-release. One of the things that the Turtles did for comic shops in a lot of ways, it kind of opened up comic shops to start carrying black and white. I remember I was helping out at a comic shop in Macomb, Illinois. Yeah. How's that for small? <laughs> and. And he didn't carry black and whites until the turtles. And then after that, it's like, oh, black and white sells. And right. you kind of moved through. As you were getting toward the end of Troll Lords, you're doing other work. Did you have to change your art to to match color? Because you talked a lot about Zipatone and, and, and that. And black and white art is very, very different from color art when it's done properly. Yeah, if I, if I had to go back and do it again, I would simplify. my, my uh, Even if I was a fan you know, in the in in the mid to early '80s, I would say '83 to '45, I was already a fan of Alex Toth and Simplification. I was already a fan of Jaime Hernandez, and that's where my head was at. But I was also reading Cerebus and looking at black and white comics, and I was definitely in the mode of a lot of cross hatching and a lot of tone and the Gerhard backgrounds and 
And uh, so that's how we did it. I would say as, as that's how I approached the finished material. I wanted to make sure it looked full. I probably didn't trust myself to, to do what Jeff Smith did a few years later um, by, by being so sparse and open. Um, because some people will look at that non-colored work as, uh, as as too simple or or too open. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think in an, in I I think now that I was young and and I just thought I needed to add something to it. I think some of that holds up. I think some of it looks good. I I and I do think that the the if you look at the last page of Trollards that I ink, it's a much more simplified uh, approach and style. Uh, than earlier, but uh, but you're right though. The black and white thing was a big deal uh, when we um, because tro uh, Turtles was successful. All the retailers were looking for were looking for the next successful book, and they could make cash from it. So uh, you know, our book was they said was selling for ten bucks, and then seventy five bucks, and a lot of the orders we got were inflated because retailers were stocking up on them and hoping to make money at it and well and that's what created the boom and the bust <laughs> right? right so not too hard to figure out but you know in our naivete when when the when we first got orders for 40,000 uh I think for issue 2 we were like oh hello we've got 40,000 readers and we were shipping the books out from a, a capital city uh distributor warehouse in Elk Grove Village in Illinois and one of the guys was like, wait, you don't think these are all actually being read, do you? And I actually <laughs> think I did a double take. Like, what do you mean they're not all being read? So, um, you know, as the numbers came down, we started to get a better idea of what our true readership was. And and unfortunately, the comics industry uh, really, you know, hasn't learned a lot because these booms and busts in different forms uh, uh, continues to happen. Um, so, but I'm, you know, I'm, we were fortunate that we were able to ride that one at that time because it kind of put us on the map and, and started the career. Uh, but you're right, uh, when we switched to Kamiko and, uh, and we did the four issues with them, we did prepare the artwork differently, uh, because it was in color and we did adapt our style, um, and left things more open. Um, and then when we went back to Apple, um, and did six issues in black and white, uh, I did a little more tone again. So, uh, yeah, I think you have to prepare it for how it's going to be prepared and presented. Um, and uh, whatever story you're doing, uh, I think you have to gauge and figure your approach to suit the material and how it's going to be presented to the reader, you know? Yeah. you got to figure that out, hopefully, before you... Uh, before you start, but uh, uh, but it was fun. It was fun, fun to do both black and white and color. I would I would do black and white now differently than I did uh, at 22. I would say. And when you moved over to DC, that's a kind of a a lot of people think that that's not a big deal, but really, you went from being an entrepreneur to okay, other people are handling the publishing, and now you're kind of doing work for hire, which in '86 started to become a dirty word among artists. Yeah, it was funny. You're right, because uh, some fan, some uh, peers, I would run into people at the convention when I started inking for DC, and they would in, they would introduce me to, to new friends, and they'd go, uh, oh, he's working, he's inking for DC now, and like, oh, don't don't worry, he's one of the good guys. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> funny that, that when we, when I started trying to make money doing comics, um, when the you know when the readership in the market changed, and we were we had to do self we, there was less money in self published comics and um, and I wanted to pay the bills. Uh, you kind of are viewed as a sellout. And a few years later, even when comics were booming, I decided I'd kind of had enough uh, for that time anyway, and I kind of achieved my dream in a couple ways. And I moved out of comics and went into commercial art and illustration doing comics out of the industry and then you're looked at as a sellout again <laughs> because you're not doing comics for the art so uh i heard it all <laughs> and uh, and i don't regret the moves so um but but i enjoyed working for dc it's just it, for some reason it wasn't as fulfilling to me even though i was working with friends and on good titles 
uh, eventually, uh, for some reason, probably because I'd already owned my own material and done it on my own, I kind of wanted to do more of that, but I also knew that probably wasn't going to uh, pay the bills, and I was, you know, married and young, young and married and wanted kids, and I was like, all right, I'm going to, how, how can I parlay this? I mean, comics is a lot of work, and a lot of times you can do a lot of work in comics for not much money, so I tried to flip the equation instead to do less work for more money. And in, in doing illustration and in doing storyboard work for Best Buy and General Mills and Target and Pillsbury and places like that, uh, I was able to work at home, uh, raise a family, be here with my kids as they grew up, work with my wife a lot, uh, who, who was able to work with me because she's an artist as well, so we would tag team on projects um, and, uh, and, and bring in a decent amount of money. Uh, the only regret I have from any of that is when you're doing that, it takes a lot of energy, and I still, all all those years, had a love for comics, and I wish I had, during those years, been able to build up a, a bigger body of work, um, but that's the only regret I have about that. And I was going to ask, is that when Blue Moon Studios came into existence? Yeah, you know... Um, you know, the, the way I look at it is I did three years uh, out of high school um, working a dumb job, and I went to, you know, uh, uh, part-time classes at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. I read, I studied, I drew comics, and I geared myself up. And, and when I quit that job in early 85, I'm like, all right, now I'm a freelance artist. So even though I, I've been a freelance artist since, you know, January 1st, 1985, um, and my wife and I had already worked together, when my daughter was born, she was born under a blue moon uh, in July of 1986, sorry, uh, 1996. I'd already been doing it for 10 years, and we decided uh, to make it official, and that's when we did launch Blue Moon Studios using that uh, name for that particular reason, which had a you know personal significance for us, um, but a lot of that was because we wanted it to be an umbrella for any creative pursuits we uh, we did. My wife with her painting, myself, uh, and to uh, set up a creative home for the girls too. And they're both artists, and they're both be appearing in their own right at that uh, at the MSP Comic Con uh, in May. Well, that'll be great. Yeah, a full circle, a family of artists, no doubt. So moving out of corporate comics into yeah. the corporate world, was that something that you had already heard about? Did you have connections, or was it just, I'm going to try this, and when things start to click, I will move into it? Uh, I would say that, that it was a mix. Um, in 91, when I was still inking the fly, I already started – uh, illustrating, you know, Where's Waldo kind of books. You can find scary monsters. I was all, already taking some of that on. Um, when I start, stopped uh, doing comics, I started doing other kinds of illustration art. And when we moved up here, there was a little bit of floundering, like, wait, what am I going to do? Do I want to do a children's book? Do I want to get back into comics? Um, and uh, and I, I got a couple gigs. And then I met a husband and wife uh, agent team, uh, artist reps, which I never wanted to do. Um, I, I just, you know, agents always, I, I heard scary things uh, about them. And, uh, but instead I formed a good relationship with them for seven years and they were able to get me established in town. Uh, I had been working with them doing illustration for a couple of years when they said, hey, you ever think of doing storyboards? And I'm like, let's go. Yes, I have. I thought about it, but, I, you know, so they, they they were able to put the connections together, and they did a lot of the legwork of figuring out what art directors needed what in town. Uh, and the thing was, um, comics trains you to – you have to be able to tell a story. you got to draw fast. you got to draw, you know, well. you got to draw a lot of different things, and you got to draw out of your head. And you, even though storyboards is a different discipline than comics and they work in different ways and have different purposes, a lot of those skills can be moved from one to the other. So for me, it was a perfect fit. And a lot of the illustrators that my agents represented uh, couldn't do comics and couldn't do storyboards. They would look at a comic page when, it, when a gig came and like, oh, my God, that's seven or eight different illustrations. And they freak <laughs> out. And I go, it's just another page. <laughs> Easy. 
uh, and storyboards is like that too. You have to draw very quickly, and you can do you know 50 drawings uh, in a couple days, and hundreds over a week, um, and uh, and certainly uh, drawing storyboards in that fast, uh, it's unfinished. It's no one ever sees it. It's conceptual work to develop and sell concepts, and uh, but they. Uh, in the advertising world, they they pay pretty darn well. So I thought that was a good equation, and I enjoyed the work, and have enjoyed the work, and still do more of that. You you mentioned something about children's books. I do remember mm -hmm. you've got a children's book, and here's the weird thing: it didn't come out from a children's book publisher. No, you know, uh, <laughs> I developed a, a a story early on called Night of the Bedbugs, and, and and I had it for so long that when the story came to me shortly after Laura was born, um, I, uh, I, I decorated her walls with the, the bed bugs and some little pig characters I had called Fun Run. So I painted the walls custom and I developed the story and I did a few pages and sent it out to traditional book publishers and it, uh, you know, just rejection after rejection. And I'd send out another wave and more rejections, and so I lost heart, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to publish it myself, but it just it took a while. And then uh, in, uh, well, seven years ago now, uh, in March of 2009, I, I went out with a buddy to just try something new and got on a snowmobile and ran in, I slid sideways into a tree and almost died. And I thought, <laughs> this was the thing, Corey. <laughs> I'm laying in bed a week later. I got a chest tube in me. I busted nine ribs. I broke my collarbone. I punctured a lung. And I was pumped up with uh, pain medication. And I, I was freaking out one night. And I had an existential crisis. I had like a full body panic attack sitting in the, uh, in, in the hospital room all alone. And I thought I was checking out. And I look forward and my vision's getting hazy. And I'm, there's a white board that they put right by the door uh, of a hospital room, and they put they, they scrawl your name on it so they can remember who you are. So I see my name <laughs> fading away, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh wow! And my wife's on the phone. And she's like, "What is happening?" And I think I'm dying. And I'm like, uh, "They say that your life flashes before your eyes, and you start reliving the whole thing." And that didn't happen. What happened? I started thinking of all the stuff I'd miss. I thought. I want to be here for Mary. I want to be here for Mary, for uh, Emily and Laura. And I want to finish that children's book, and I want to do my work. <laughs> and uh, and that's what hit me. And so when I calmed down and they told me what had happened, and then I developed you know further problems after that, as I was getting better, like, geez, a month after I was, even though I was still in pain and uh, I hadn't developed more, uh, I, I developed PTSD that summer. So I'm sitting there a month afterwards, and I'm still, uh, you know, my bones are still healing. And I thought, i got to make good on this. And I, and I started poking around, how could I get this children's book out? And I reached out to some friends, uh, and they pointed me, they told me, you know, you might want to try Silverline. Valentino at Image is, has his, started his own little uh, children's book line, and it might be a good fit. So I took that pitch and I sent it to him. And an hour later, he emailed back and said, "I love it. We're doing it." <laughs> <laughs> and they and they were already, you know, publishing books that were eight by eight or nine by nine, exactly the format that I w that I had worked uh, that I'd already started, but bed bugs on. So uh, the great thing about doing that was I was able to follow through fairly rapidly after having that trauma and crisis and start putting into action, putting the work out that I really cared about. Um, I made money from it. Uh, I don't think the line lasted uh, too long. Uh, some of that had to do with, you know, bookstores, large bookstores going under b borders, ordered a lot of books for from Jim and other places. And uh, so he had to close that line and went on to other stuff. But my book uh, did well. Uh, I made money from it. I was glad to get it done, and then I started moving on to other projects. But uh, uh, ever since that accident and, and having gotten that book out, that's it's kind of hit me that even though I'm still paying bills and even though I'm still doing, uh, you know, uh, corporate work, uh, it kind of relit a fire and kind of reset my priorities 
where I just can't shake it, Corey. I I love comics, and I just want to do comics more than anything. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out different ways that I can keep doing that and do them on my own terms. And one of the things you've talked about, if if you follow Paul's Facebook page, and I highly recommend you do, there's tons of funny stories, great pictures, but there's also a lot of, like, here's how to do this sort of thing. You have talked about how the accident sort of changed how you look at the world and describing your panic attack. I, I actually did an episode a few months ago about the fact that I have anxiety and panic attacks and how I deal with them. Is it Was there something that helped you kind of get through those? Was it artistic? Was it therapeutic? Was it family? How are you able to kind of bring that all under control so that you can do all the stuff that you're doing? Uh, the 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 uh, the condition and the disease itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, it was for me initially. Uh, I was look. I never had any kind of anxiety. I think I like minorly hyperventilated for 20 seconds a, a couple months before I turned 40. You know, because that mortality thing hit me. <laughs> but that was it. I was good under pressure. I'd never really had any anxiety. If I got down, it didn't. It wasn't that deep and didn't last that long. Um, and then after the accident, everything changed. Uh, I I was not a proponent of medication. I thought it was over uh, prescribed, and and, and those con conditions were di over diagnosed, especially for kids. And uh, a lot of my opinions of that have changed through my experience. So if it wasn't for uh, you know, heavy duty um, psych med meds and the the TLC from my wife and my kids. I don't know if I would have gotten through it. Uh, it's it serious. It was serious. It still dogs me, <laughs> and uh, and that's seven years afterwards. So it, yeah. it, when you when you hit something like this, uh, when you have some kind of traumatic event like that, the doctors tell you oh, maybe it'll take a year or maybe it'll take two. And then you get there and they're like, oh, this is usually a four or five year process. And, you know, but they all, they all say it will take you, the trauma and the aftermath of it will always be part of you for the rest of your life. But it will fade over time as you get further away from the actual incident. And, and that's true. Um, but I, I don't know what it was because on one hand, when it occurred, I mean, Seriously, I asked the doctor, uh, you know, <laughs> the morning after I hit the tree, <laughs> I asked him, I said, I've got a job to do. I'm doing storyboards. Can I do that in the, ho in, in the hospital room? <laughs> and I did. Mary brought the lap board to me, and I was drawing, and then she would take stuff home. She'd pick it up, and she'd color it because I didn't want to give up the job, and I felt I had an obligation. Now, I, I probably should have called the guy and said, I can't do this. I almost died. Um, but there was something, a drive in me that I felt I, I should do it. Um, and for months after that happened, and I remember inking the Night of the Bed Bugs pages on a lap board in the living room rather than the studio because I didn't want to be alone and my hand was shaking and I just inked through it. Uh, I, I, I don't know why. I don't know how um, I worked through some of that stuff and how, and, and, and it, it, a more debilitating and difficult thing for me now is that it takes so long. Is that I think I should have gotten over it a while ago, or I should have been stronger <laughs> to get through it or beat that stuff. So it's it's a daily or weekly or monthly or yearly uh, uh, realization that, you know, it can be a long process and there can be a lot of ups and downs. Um, and that gets frustrating. I don't know if has that been true for you that the, that it's ups and downs and it, and it takes a little uh, time to navigate. It took it's taken me a while to learn how to navigate the the anxiety and the panic attacks themselves. Yep. Because for me, the hardest thing is when you're in it, knowing you know what I'm thinking is irrational. I know right. that what I'm thinking is not the way the world is but I can't stop. And the other thing that really has just kind of come to light to me over the last year or two is I did 20 years in, in juvenile justice. Right. 
I read a lot of files of teenagers who went through some pretty horrific things. Yep. And then I would work with them for six, seven, eight, nine months, mm -hmm. helping them navigate this stuff. And it would just, you know, the, the, things would just pop up. And now with me, something will remind me, oh, yeah, I worked with this kid who had to deal with this. Right. And it will hit me out of the blue. And trigger it. So, yeah. So yeah. you kind of you kind of learn to steer differently. Or a the one phrase that I've I've heard a lot is, you know, you make your weather for the day. <laughs> and I can wake up and know, okay, today is not going to be one of my better days. So my to-do list has to shrink. I have to make sure that I'm taking care of myself. I will check in with people to say, hey, you know, here's how I'm feeling today. If I message you and say, are we good? It's not that I'm mad at you or upset with you. It's no, my anxiety is at a level that I don't think – I'm a likable person, so are we good? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I was, I was on a heavy psych med for five years, and, and the last two years coming off it, because I was really driven to get off, has been difficult uh, coming off of them. And I've had, uh, yeah, uh, I would say that, that I was driven to get off of, of, the, of more serious psych meds, but getting off of them can lead to repercussions and, uh, until your body finds the right balances. So uh, as best I can, I'm trying to uh, get through these things uh, w with as natural a means as possible. I'm not always up for working out, but I try. Uh, I, uh, I started meditating recently, and that's helping a little bit. But, you know, when I was in the, the worst of the PTSD when it first hit, like you said, it was, uh, it, it's an irrational thing. <laughs> you know, when I, when I was at my worst, I remember I couldn't sleep one night, and I got up and I walked around and I couldn't find a pulse, and I was convinced that I was like my heart wasn't beating. <laughs> and I went to Mary and I was like, "Oh my gosh, what's going on?" And she'd say, um, "If if your heart what if your heart wasn't beating, um, you wouldn't be walking around." You know. So, yeah. uh, you know, constantly when you're dealing with that kind of anxiety or panic, you just have to learn those tricks to b calm yourself down, breathe through it, and uh, uh, and and you learn. And it's not as uh, severe, um, uh, and it's easier to get through than it used to be. It's not, I'm not nearly where I was uh, in the deepest throes of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is a comfort. <laughs> Uh, big time. Now, you say your art has slowed down since then. My what? You said that your art and your ability to draw has slowed down um, a little bit. Uh, it has uh, to some extent, yeah. I've still uh, continued to work through all of it. There were times when, uh, when I was dealing with the worst of that, where I just did what I could, uh, and that's true of sleep issues as well. Um, and uh, corporate work can be different too, and that comes and goes. Uh, so sometimes that's there's more than you can handle. Uh, so and and other times there's there's not enough, you know. Um, so you learn to deal with that the longer you freelance. Um, but uh, uh, what was the, what was your question again? We were gonna actually. I was gonna ask now that you talk about you're wanting to get back into comics. Has the type of story you want to tell and the type of art you want to draw changed in a way because of all that you've gone through? Uh, yes, uh, there are projects that I'm considering and that I'm that I'm working on uh, that are directly related to the the stuff I've gone through. It's colored uh, how what kind of things I, I do. And the, the way I write and the kind of material I've developed now is different by a stretch because of my experiences and, and my age. Um, and, uh, and that's the kind of stuff I'm working on now. On the other hand, um, another therapeutic thing, I, you know, when you're just passionate about it, that itself can be a reason to keep going. It's frustrating when, when you feel down and, and you don't have 
what it takes to, to tap into what you want to do the most. Um, but one of the things that really helped me um, a few years after the incident was that I started teaching at uh, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Uh, Barb Schultz, who runs that program for some years now, uh, was after me for seven years to teach there, and I kept saying no. Uh, because of corporate work, because the girls were younger, because I didn't think I had time, I, didn't, I, I, I always knew I wouldn't mind teaching, but I thought, um, I just didn't think the time was right. Uh, and after the incident, I, I, and after, after that all occurred, I thought, she asked again, I was like, you know, <laughs> maybe the time is right now. And part of that was, how am I gonna handle it being out and about? Because uh, I'm a pretty uh, social uh, and open guy, uh, but all that experience uh, turned it around sometimes on me. And so it was very th therapeutic and fun for me to get out, uh, uh, hang out with young uh, art students who were passionate about the same thing I was. You know, you're dealing with a classroom of people who have been passionate about comics for a few years or their whole lives or 10 years or whatever, and they can't believe there's a school that teaches it. <laughs> yeah. And they're in a room with other people who, from across the country who have the same journey and path and, and interest and passion. So um, doing new work is, is, a, uh, is a, uh, a therapeutic thing for me, trying to uh, work through some of the issues I've dealt with through work uh, is a therapeutic and uh, a good outlet, a therapeutic thing and a good outlet, and and then continuing to teach is as well. Um, it 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 helps me tap into you know what I'm interested in, um, and uh, and it's kind of fun when I'm teaching uh, and have that weekly cl class to go to uh, for that day to just be totally focused um, on trying to impart what I think is important and trying uh, to help uh, young artists uh, develop their skills and craft. Now, in these classes, yeah. do you talk about anything other than Alex Toad? <laughs> 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 yes, I do, but, <laughs> but it's recurring. <laughs> he, he and his work are recurring, and I, I say to them, uh, even in the class I'm teaching this spring, um, he's my favorite cartoonist. This is why I talk about him, and this will not be the last time I talk about him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we co I cover a lot of topics. Whether I'm te teaching intro to comics or pro prac, where you're, you know, trying to figure the business end and how to uh, balance uh, a financial financial concerns with a cr living a creative life, uh, or the current class I'm teaching, materials and techniques, all of these things. Um, uh, I try to tackle a variety of subjects, but you know, I can't help it. Toth just keeps coming up. And, and I remember one of the first conventions where I actually got a chance to sit down and talk with you. Yeah. You, you talked about nothing but Toth and Alex Nino. No, I'm not a big Alex Nino fan, but... At the time, you, I had mentioned that he had done this paperback novel type thing, and I saw your eyes just light up. He's... um. I, I like his work and I like looking at it, but to me, it's uh, he. It, as I get older, uh, and as I do this longer, this the the people who simplify and are less ornate in their work are the ones that get me buzzing. And Toth is the epitome of that. And 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 a lot of the people who are, um, a lot of people are working in that vein now. Currently, in comics, are the one that get get me the most jazzed. So, uh, I I don't know. There there was something about the first time I saw Toth's work that just got me uh, excited. I couldn't believe somebody was drawing like that. Um, and and then I just started seeking out his work uh, like crazy. But you know, part of after my accident, part of I just wanted to like. I had a little time, you know, <laughs> because I, I couldn't do this. The, well, when, when there wasn't a job, right, and I handled the job as best I could, uh, when there was downtime, I didn't want to work on my own stuff right away, and I started a blog just about Toth stuff. And I'd always loved it, but I was like, why? 
you know, and I, I'd analyzed it to some extent, but I, I started the blog just to figure out and analyze what there was about it, and that set it up. And when Barb uh, at MCAD was t telling the people at the design department uh, that I could teach, she pointed him to my blog and said, "He see, see take a look at this. <laughs> this is how he thinks, and he, it's a shoe in and it's not a problem. But that process led me, I think, to uh, the same thing I do for classes. Um, it, it helps me when I'm prepping for class uh, and for students to analyze and break down uh, what we learn from those who have done it before, what's what's a you know what are different kinds of uh, valid and and worthwhile approaches to doing our work to telling stories and so on and uh even though he you know Alex Toth worked on mostly uh, poor scripts and um and uh, and cheap cartoons uh the the way he approached it uh I, it's just with an intelligence and with a sense of design that I don't think anyone else has done. So um, I, I just think that's an important thing to impart. <laughs> I, one of the things that I always enjoy about certain artists, and Toth is one of them, but there's also writers and other people, yep. as they learn their craft, they start stripping away the extra stuff. Right. Um, they get to the essence. They get to the, the bare bones of it. And Toth is very good about he stripped away every line that didn't add anything wasn't there. Much like the old kill your darlings when it comes to writing, I don't care if this is the most beautiful thing you've ever written. Every word that doesn't move the story forward, you, you take that red pen and you get rid of it. Yeah, quite right. And, and, and uh, Go ahead. Is that hard to impart on younger artists because a lot of them – yeah, you know, when you're young, you're in love with all of your extras. Uh yes, plus you're you're you know, you're just starting out to figure out what kind of stories you want to tell and you're still trying to prove to yourself um that you can draw and you're still trying to figure out what your style is and all that. And so, you know, when I look at the work I was doing at 22, I just didn't trust myself to to strip it down and apply what I was learning from what I was looking at and what I loved. It took some years till I started doing that more and more in my work. It is difficult. Um, I think that, I mean, what is it? That's that one line. I don't know if Toth was paraphrasing Roy Crane, uh, but he said something like, uh, you know, strip it down to its essentials and draw the hell out of what's left. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, the when he started visiting the offices, uh, the, of the different publishers when, when he was 15, and he kept bringing in new work, the editors there, Shelley Mayer and Saul Harrison mainly, would say, you still don't know what to leave out. <laughs> so he took that to heart and went to work at it, and he looked at, he studied, I'm convinced, uh, the famous Artist Guild books from the late 40s and started applying them. And if you look at his work, uh, you see glimpses of that stuff in the late 40s and early 50s, but by 1952, he was already drawing, you know, what have become classics in in comics with Crush Gardenian and a series of others. So, uh, and if you, you know, the, he went through periods after that where he was still drawing too much or, you know, he went through a different period where it wasn't as succinct as, as uh as, as it could be, but he, he was already producing great work that I, st I think stands up with stuff he was doing later. And then the last 20 years of his life when he was, you know, a recluse and not doing much published work, he just kept drawing and drawing and drawing. And if you, you, you've seen them, right, all these a la premia uh, little doodles he did. And there was that, and then he would write these long well. handwritten letters <laughs> to the comics journal where he would just pontificate. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> it was the opposite of his art. I suppose. In well, many well ways. this is true. If you look at uh, what Toth tried, uh, did, when he tried to do his own stories, he, he wasn't a writer, and it was something that he struggled with. And, uh, you know, he did do a few things that he wrote himself that hold up and are pretty entertaining and, and fun. 
Um, and he got his, his hands on some good scripts that he turned into gold, um, mostly with, you know, Kaniger and Kurtzman and, and uh, Goodwin and others. But um, he wasn't much of a writer. Uh, and I suppose when you're, uh, when you're holed up uh, with just you and your cigarettes and stacks of stuff, <laughs> um, uh, you know, he could have completely cut himself off. From a certain perspective, he reached out to fandom by being so, uh, uh, so uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Loquacious. Uh, he, he did, you know, a lot of, uh, he, for, for a recluse, he did sure, uh, write a lot of letters to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. He wrote those notes and postcards. And in many ways, a lot of those notes that he wrote and a lot of those, uh, essays that he sent in, um, there's a lot of pearls of wisdom in there and there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, you know, we could all lament that he didn't produce more work, a more finished work during that period. Um, but for a guy who was probably uh, manic depressive and or bipolar, um, that he kept working at all is kind of a good thing. <laughs> and that he gave us what he was able to give us is uh, is a good thing, too. I think all those things are, I take them, and I'm grateful for them, and I consider them a blessing, you know. That at least there's something there, even if it's not everything we would have preferred. I think when it comes to artists that we, we treasure, it doesn't matter how much they've done. Eventually, we want more. I've done – the way you speak of Toth is the way I speak of Kirby. Yeah. And I did – I've done an audio biography of Kirby, and I'm still discovering new stuff he's done. And a lot of the stuff he did in the 50s has passed into public domain, so you can download it legally and read it. And – even though there's there's all this out there, I look at his period from like 62 to 75, and it's he was killing himself, and it's oh, if only there had been more, because <laughs> because you just you you just you you become insatiable for that stuff. You want to see how he handled everything, and I can see how with Toth because there's not as much that insatiability keeps growing. Oh, there, there's and, out of that. I mean, with Toth, if you really look at what he did, he did tons of work over, you know, what, five decades, four decades, I'd say. Um, and that's, you know, within animation design and storyboards and, and within comics. And if you really look at it, there's tons to look at. But it's nothing compared to Kirby. Because Kirby, during his heyday, during, you know, when he was in, in his 40s, right, that's when yeah. the, the Marvel – you know, rekindled in 61, 62. And he was drawing, he was such a commodity. They used him for, as an idea man and a story generator. And because he could, you know, uh, bang out the layouts quickly. So, you know, he would do 10 pages a day. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> that was one of the things that I could not believe as I'm going through and looking at the number of pages printed per month. Right. You know, we talk about how in the 60s, you know, he's drawing two monthly books, um, two half books, annuals, and all of that. But then look at the 50s. Right. His output was almost as big, spread out over even more. It's like, okay, I'm going to do a Western, and tomorrow I do a love story, and then, oh, i got to do Fight an American, and then I'm going to do the crime story, and then I've got a horror story to put out. Oh, we're going to put out this book about people's dreams. It's just I, even me as a writer, I think Stephen King would look at that and go, "There's no way I could keep up with that." <laughs> right, right. No way. Well, and and in, in many ways, even though they have slightly different stories, they really were young guys. Toth, uh, Kirby, uh, Hubert, all those guys started early, and and they just had a love for this thing and then wanted to pursue it, uh, and they didn't want to give it up, and it's what they knew. And it's what they became good at. So even in the 50s, when a lot of people, you know, were embarrassed to work in comics or got out or got knocked out of it, those guys kept doing it. Yep. Uh, and, and in many ways, they were just working guys who were paying the bills for their families. And you hear those stories when Kirby was drawing. I don't know when this happened. I don't know if it happened more than once. I doubt it's apocryphal. I believe it. Uh, that Kirby was drawing all day. You know, he'd be drawn and drawn and drawn, 
And Roz, uh, Kirby and his wife just kept things moving and she'd wake up and he wouldn't be in bed. <laughs> and he, she'd go down to the drawing table that we've all seen and he'd be drawing away, almost kind of half asleep and keep, keep drawing. And she'd like time to get up. She'd have to like get him back to bed because I don't think he turned it off. And I think a lot of that was because he was just a guy who liked to work, you know, who liked to provide for the family and that's what you're supposed to do. Um, but it also is he had a love for that. If you look at any of the stuff, if you heard of Kirby at a convention be, before he passed, and if you look at any interviews that he did, he was the ultimate cheerleader. And the main thing that I recall him saying and, and the stuff that I, uh, the interviews that I've read, he would say, he would just be a cheerleader, man. He would light you on fire, like, go do this if you love it. And he would say, do your own thing. Yeah. So it's kind of funny to me that the the industry in Hollywood is is propped up uh in large part by uh mostly what he did um and uh and uh, I don't think uh, I don't think he would tell everybody to do that. Uh what I remember him saying was go out and do your own thing. I yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, that's what I try to do. One of one of the projects I've got going on now is a, uh, uh, you know, I look at what uh, is out, what was out in 86. I looked at, you know, trying to start a career and I, you know, I looked into how the industry worked at the time and figured out the distribution. And when I'm teaching students now at MCAT about entering the field, I'm saying survey it, learn it and figure it out. Because even though the direct sales market is around, um, now there are different ways that you can monetize and different ways you can get your work out there. So there's, there are more opportunities to get work out there, but there's more competition as well. Right. Yeah. But you can, you can tap into different niche markets. So one of the, one of the projects I've been trying to do is I've got this character I've been working on for a couple of years called Mato the Snowboy, And uh, I thought it'd be fun to put together a, uh, anthology for kids that recaptures, you know, the feeling I remember getting um, on Saturday mornings uh, when, well, geez, I, you know, when I went to bed Friday nights, I could barely contain myself. <laughs> you had you had a hard time getting me up uh, on Sunday mornings for church or for school all week, but on Saturday mornings I was uh, I was up very early to watch cartoons, and uh, so I, I've put together uh, a group of creators to. Uh, you know, do their own stuff the way Kirby would uh, recommend uh, to uh, and uh, to band together to kind of, kind of recapture that feeling. So uh, I'll be doing Mato the Snowboy uh, for this book. It's a, it's a, the group is called uh, Cartoon Jam, and the the anthology books we'll be putting together are called Saturday Morning Serials. So that's S E R A I A L S. And it's a series of stories, and everybody has their own characters. I'll be doing uh, Snowboy. Vivian Ng is doing Sadie and Chico, which is a a uh, like a ninja girl and uh, a ninja dog uh, that, that develop magical skills. Denver Brubaker is doing uh, Petty Panther with a bunch of uh, fun jungle tales on a, a mysterious uh, enchanted island, lots of different creatures. Um, if you've never heard of this, uh, Jim Anderson does a, a thing called, a webcomic called Ellie on Planet X. She's a little uh, robot that is sent off to explore Planet X. And uh, and so her adventures follow that, uh, all these different creatures she discovers on this planet. Uh, and then Betsy Peterschmidt, a young, very talented creator, um, is doing uh, When Pigs Fly. Uh, about this little guardian angel pig who's trying to earn his wings. So I think we've got a good crew together and people can easily go to Cartoon Jam on Facebook or our Patreon page and we're trying to tap into, you know, the different ways uh, that creators can support the kind of work they want to do the most. Um, and uh, our aim right now is to get the first volume together uh, and we'll be releasing it digitally and then uh, in print after that. 
Uh, I don't know if we'll raise funds on Kickstarter or we'll send it to a publisher. Um, and ideally, I'd like to do a couple volumes a year, but I want to do a larger, um, well, not, you know, not quite a, a super large European size album, but we want to do a soft cover book rather than uh, a floppy comic. Uh, there'd be 40 pages of material in, in these books, uh, and it'd be fairly substantial and chock full of, uh, of uh, fun and, and story. And, and a wide variety of different kinds of stuff uh, as well. So um, I'm really I'm really excited about the work the work that everyone's turning in on this stuff, um, and it's great to be surrounded by a great uh, talented group of people who are doing all ages comics. So you, what we see is a I don't know you know when we're talking about Kirby doing that stuff in the '60s, the the comic book industry didn't even know if it was going to last. And even 10 years later, or 15 years later, Neil Adams predicted that comics would be dead in five years, if you recall. Oh, yeah. So the direct sales market, in some ways, in many ways, uh, saved comics when they were getting pushed off of newsstands. Um, but it also helped uh, ghettoize comics. And publishers just got, you know, when, when superheroes came along and kind of rejuven rejuvenated the industry, uh, they, you know, the industry's just been uh, playing to that for a long, long time, and you know, for a long time, they just uh, kept churning out stuff for young teenage boys, right? Young kids, boys would get a certain age, and they'd start the whole four-year cycle again, and just keep doing work for that. At some point, because of the direct sales, they, you know, they kept doing superheroes, but then tried to grow up and be mature, so-called. With uh, with those boys as they grew up, but what we're seeing now, I think, in comics, I don't know how you feel about it as you're tracking comics and what's done, but I think creatively we're we're working uh, and reading in in a golden age of comics where there probably isn't there's probably a wider variety of comics and genres being done now than I'd say since the early days of the comic strips. Um, where a lot of different things were available. And uh, one of the things that I see happening, and it's happening quickly now and long overdue, is that uh, uh, female readers are being courted by publishers. Um, and we see a burgeoning readership with uh, young girls. Uh, and because of that, in manga that was you know, translated and available during the early 2000s, um, more and more of these uh, young girls who were growing up reading that stuff um, are now entering the field or have been doing it for 10 years and becoming successful. And some of what we're trying to do with Cartoon Jam uh, is to tap into that. I think all of the, uh, the properties we have are appealing to all ages and to uh, male readers too, but especially to female readers and uh, and that's why it was important for me to to get you know to secure two young female creators to be part of the team because I do think that's where things are going and we and, and we'll see more of a, a balance um, in the kind of work that's being done. I mean, when you survey what's out there, when you see the success of Raina Telgmeier on the New York Times bestseller list with all of her books, aren't you encouraged? Aren't you happy that this is finally happening? I am amazed at the diversity, and one of the things that we talk about on 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 the show I do with Joe and and Jen Wicked yep. is that when you do an all ages comic, that doesn't mean it's a kids comic. Right. The Simpsons is an all ages comic. Quite right. And beautifully done. Um, ah, yeah, comics. Right. Those are just so much fun. And those creators have developed their own sort of style and way they do things. And even going back, look at the, the Disney books that, that did really well. It, a, a little kid would read Uncle Scrooge, and then a teenager would read it for the adventure, and then an adult would read it and get the other stuff that Carl Barks was throwing in. So that all ages meant all ages. And a lot of the problems with the, quote, all ages comics that they did once – comics left newsstands and left grocery stores and left your your Walgreens and and places was uh, it's a kid's book just just nobody cares 
it just throw somebody on it who we've got under contract and um, let them do the pages. Right. And, and, and dumb it down for kids. Whereas yeah, yeah. if you look at the stuff that's really good, the people who did it were excellent artists who were doing great stories. It right. wasn't, okay, throw in a bunch of puns and we're done. Right. They were actually cr trying to craft stories that anybody could appreciate. It. Um, when, when my mom was young, she said that her dad would give her a buck to go down to the store and pick up 10 comics because you can get them for a dime then in the 30s or early 40s. And uh, and he'd say always, you know, make sure you get a Donald Duck or get Uncle Scrooge or whatever. He had his favorites and the whole family would read them. It would go through the whole house. You heard when Jaime Hernandez was in town a couple of years ago, he was saying the same thing happened uh, with his family. Um, and the, the challenge we have is that um, comics uh, were always a disposable medium. Uh, they were an uh, inexpensive disposal medium, medium, but they were uh, the format was ready, readily available to kids at their level on newsstands, at the bookstores, uh, you know, at the candy shops, whatever. And uh, and and that's not true anymore. So the challenge is to find different ways to uh, get to young readers because I think we're starting to see more of that material uh, available now. I, I think all the you know the licensed comics that Boom does and IDW does is great. Um, but, you know, those are with established characters that people know through the uh, Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon. What we're trying to do with Cartoon Jam is our, no, our own version of that, uh, having total control over our characters. But, you know, uh, I've heard over the years that all ages is not a, a tag that uh, book publishers or booksellers like. And uh, but we're steering in, into it anyway because I just think that's the best <laughs> description <laughs> of of what we're trying to do. And if and you know if you think of when Pixar uh, was really riding high, I think they faltered a little bit more recently. But for quite a long while, <clears throat> they knew that. Uh, you know, even though they were doing movies for kids, that the parents were bringing the kids to the movies. Uh, so, uh, as you know, as a service to the kids to tell the best story they could and to make sure that the, the parents weren't bored because there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's done for kids that is subpar and talking down to them. And they just made sure that they were really on top of story and character. And and those movies become classics, like Was It of Oz before it and, and others, um, because they're not talking down to kids and because they're dealing with substantial stuff that is appealing to adults as well. We're trying in our own way with Cartoon Jam and Saturday Morning Serials to do that that same thing. I I you you really touch on something there because I worked at a movie theater five six years ago mm -hmm. and. Some of the parents would bring out their kids and go, well, this movie's too scary. And it would be a G-rated film, and it would be a Disney re-release. <laughs> and you just think back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> That's some scary stuff. Or The yeah. Wizard of Oz. That's yeah. some scary stuff. Yeah, there's frightening stuff in there. You can't, it can't be, you can't just feed the kids cotton candy. Uh, no, and and I think you're right. I think there were scary moments in in in, uh, in Seven Dwarfs. I think there uh, that Bambi uh, very scary moments um, uh, with. Uh, I'm not spoiling anything here. Um, well, the movie. Come on, the movie's old. The movie's old enough. Okay, we can spoil it. <laughs> yeah, sure. With the mother being killed, and and then uh, uh, Wizard of Oz. I heard Maurice Sendak who also did a scary book, Where the Wild Things Are, that charged me up when I was a little kid first hearing in the in the library. Uh, he said that uh, kids just have an intuitive sense what these things are about. And and his take on it was that it's a, Dorothy's whole story, the whole Oz story, is a death dream. That when, when Dorothy is knocked on the head, everyone's saying, at the end of the movie, they say, we almost lost you or something like that. Yeah. We didn't, it's she they thought she was checking out <laughs> so the whole thing i think taps into that and that movie you know when i was a kid was on once a year and it was a big special event but adults and kids could uh, watch it and kids knew that there was more going on with that story than just you know lollipop killed uh, you know uh, songs with munchkins you know what i mean uh, there was a there's a lot of uh 
uh, really, well, integral stuff that goes right like to the to our lizard brain. <laughs> you know, it's life and death kind of uh, stuff. Now I don't know if we're going to get that you know uh, deep uh, with the stories we're doing, uh, but we do want them to be substantial and not just something that people can zip through. We want them to be you know, stories that feature characters where people return to them and want to read more and come and come back for more. And we want to put them into a format that is accessible with digital, but also substantial uh, in terms of uh, book format. We, we want it to be able to go into libraries and and schools uh, and uh, and so on. And last question I'm going to have, because I've taken up a lot of your time, you talk about digital. Has there been a change in how you draw your art, knowing that some people are going to be looking at it on an iPod and maybe some I'm an iPad, right. and some people may even be looking at it on their phone? Has that um, changed how you draw? Well, I, I can answer that from two different uh, angles. One is that a few – I've had a, a Cintiq – screen on which I draw for about 10 years. And I've been drawing with some kind of tablet or working with a tablet in some fashion for 20 years. Um, but most of that time, until about three, four years ago, I did most of my work the traditional way by hand, and then I used the computer to augment or finish off work. Um, I started working on, I created Snowboy, or right around the time I started working and playing around with Manga Studio, which I thought was a very cool software. And everything I've ever done with that character, and we're, and you can go on Blue Moon Tunes and, and read the first chapter of uh, Snowboy's Tale, all of that done is done digitally. Now, when I'm approaching digital work, and I barely, my drawing board is lonely. I barely work over there anymore. <laughs> I still draw by hand, um, and I make sure I keep a pencil and a brush around and I carry my sketchbook around, to keep my hand in with that, and, I, and there are comics I'm planning that I will still draw by hand, but almost all my work is done nowadays, comics work, corporate work, illustration work, uh, digitally. And what I try to do with it, because I've been drawing a while, is bring a sensibility to it that it's still organic and looks hand-drawn. And that wasn't possible for a while because the software wasn't as good and and for me, it took a little while to get used to drawing digitally on the screen. Um, so, however I do it, when I'm whether I'm drawing traditionally um, or analog uh, or digitally, uh, I try to make sure that it it looks like it has a custom, you know, touch of the hand. I miss the visceral, you know, tactile sense of. Uh, of the, that feeling of the paper and the, and the brush against the, 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 the page, and that's why I keep doing that and, and sketching and keeping my hand in. Um, but I think I've been doing this long enough that, um, that I, I keep that kind of organic feel to it. A lot of people look at the Snowboy pages and they're surprised that they were drawn digitally. Uh, part of the reason I can keep that look is because I barely penciled anything. I would lay the pages out uh, with a very, loose blue line um, and hardly have anything going on there at all. And because I can undo with the Command-Z, uh, with, the, with the old <laughs> keyboard, I can make a stroke very quick, very loose. If it doesn't hit, I'll just undo and I'll, I'll just keep working, undoing it until I get the stroke I want. And, uh, and when I'm d doing that stuff, uh, doing any work digitally, I try my best to get as much of the drawing done uh, in the line art rather than overworking the pencil to make it make sure it's nailed down. I want as much I want it to be clean and polished and look presentable, but I want uh, as much expression to come through in the line as I can. And now there's so many, I mean, you know, the software's improved, the kind of custom brushes that are d developed and made available have improved the, the, the speed um, with which the, the computers move is, is better. And then when you're drawing right on that magic glass of the Cintiq, it, it, you know, it, it's, once you get used to that, uh, it, it's fast and it's easy. So I know a lot of people, a lot of pros, 
who uh, avoided working digitally for a long time, and most of them are hopping over uh, and doing that. Now, you know, the other thing is you talked about how things are presented. Um, I think I don't. I'm surprised floppy comics are still available. I don't think they're a viable form. I don't think they make much sense, but I think people are still used to it. Uh, but eventually, I think that you know, for periodical quick fixes, every two weeks, every four weeks, we'll go to all digital, and then stuff will just be collected, or things will just come out in volumes straight to print. I don't think print will go away. But those floppies don't make much sense to me, even though they were the linchpin of the of the industry for for many decades. So one of the things we did consider for Cartoon Jam was whether we should do a fixed panel size and make them just swipeable panel by panel for an iPhone, because that is one way you can go directly to kids, and, and that, that's one of the things we could have done. Um, I don't like these hybrid things where the where an artist will do a full page and then things will be cut up to be pinched or swiped and moved around um, to be read a different way. Uh, if you're going to design it for, you know, swipeable panel by panel comics, I think that's great. And, and there's, a, there's a couple stories I want to do that, you know, are actually formatted to fit on an iPad that size to be read at that size and to be read in that fashion. You see other people have been doing web comics and digital comics in that fashion. Um, but I think if you're doing that, you should design it for that. Um, and, you know, we decided for Saturday Morning Serials to, we just, I just like the page too much. I just like the, the, the composition of the page and seeing panel after panel and how artists use the panels to tell a story and how they arrange things and, and uh, get the eye to flow through the page. I love that too much and I love that big, um, European style size, uh, <laughs> comic to totally give that away, but it is something I have been thinking about, and I do think it's a viable way. I mean, if you're if you're going to try to reach kids with comics, I think probably the smartest way you can go is right to uh, the devices that they carry with them, because they don't see it at the newsstand or at the grocery store anymore, right at the checkout counter. You got to go right to where they're at. What's that new uh, comics? Um, reading app that oh there are all kinds of them there's comiXology has one right um i i use marvel unlimited <laughs> and i it, it's amazing because oh look here's pretty much everything marvel has published up to about six months ago right i and can you, you can go right I, to it and right there stuff. yep i have been reading every joe manili story that is available on there because he's an artist who I really didn't know a lot about till about 10, 15 years ago. And his work just blows me away. I've heard and the, the fact name, that but I'll have to check out more. Um, the best, the best way to find his stuff is the uh, black Knight series from the fifties. And there's a Marvel masterwork that has his black Knight series, as well as Kirby and Feldstein's yellow claw. Oh, I will check those one out. book. I know I've seen some of that stuff, but I have not delved into it. So I will, I will take a look. I wish I could remember what this new app is because people are starting to do stories directly for that app um, that is designed just to be read panel by panel uh, on the phone. And you know, and who knows? I might, I might develop one of my stories just for that app uh, rather than releasing it as a PDF on my own to tap into. Again, you got to look at what's out there and uh, you know Larry Martyr the Bean World guy and the guy who helped make sure that Image Comics uh, survived and got off the ground uh, said told me years ago as long as there are people who want to create comics and read comics there'll be somebody in the middle to make sure they, they they bridge the gap so the distribution system the delivery system can change that can be digital, it can be a floppy comic, it can be, you know, it can be all these different things. It can be a big screen, uh, it could be, you know, uh, printed books, uh, uh, but we'll, th there'll be someone in the middle to make sure it gets from one to the other. And, and it's us, up to us as creators to tap into what those new trends are and what the new opportunities are and then lean into those creatively, if that makes any sense. And there are always going to be people who read a comic and go, I want to do that. Well, that, that's true. My, um, my classes are full of those. 
Um, when I was that age, I, I had the paperwork all ready to go to the only school that did that, the Joe Kubert School. I just decided that when I was 17 that I didn't want to start my uh, potential career in debt, so I opted not to go. Um, but now there are, you know, uh, more and more schools across the country that are teaching comics. There's a few where you can earn a degree. Um, MCAD was the first. And uh, the interesting thing is, the last four years now since I've been teaching, 70% of my students are female. So, uh, again, that would not happen unless there was some kind of reading material available 15, 20 years ago, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, it just wouldn't have occurred. And now things seem to be happening at an exponential rate. And, and it's working so much, uh, meaning, uh, female created stuff for female readers, not exclusively, but primarily or, or, uh, or to some degree, is becoming successful that even the big publishers are, are uh, tapping into it uh, and, and using it and starting to, you know, uh, get female uh, creators and, and looking toward female readership. So to me, that just means a more vital um, uh, industry and a, a more vital uh, medium. We have, you're right, we have tons of people who want to do comics, and comics are uh, a low entry thing. You can just have a pencil and a piece of paper and start drawing, <laughs> and you're doing comics. Plus, you can just go, you know, make copies, or you can publish something online very easily. So there's, there aren't impediments to where there used to be to create it or to get it out. Uh, and uh, and uh, now the challenge will be, you know, how to, how do we expand the readership? And I think it's starting to happen. And I think some of the, the things we talked about here today uh, are part of that. Well, I just want to wrap up by thanking you for coming on and talking about all this stuff and, and really being honest about the whole process. Because it's one of those things where I imagine it's like that with you, where all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, I've been in this field for a long time. How did that happen? Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, when I, the, the first time I was teaching, I, uh, the very first class, I, I, put a, I brought some Troll Lords pages. Uh, you know, I brought some DC pages. I brought current stuff, and I put them up on the wall. And as I was talking about it, I realized that the pages were older than everyone in the class. And then I knew I'd been around a while. Um, but that is a, uh, it's a, it's, I've always just tried as best I can regardless of the work I'm doing, to tell stories and find the, the, the best way to do it, whether it's educational comics or storyboards or my own stories or, or working for a company. And I'm still trying to find ways to do that now. Um, and, and it's exciting then, too, uh, to bring it back to Troll Lords to get some of that earlier material out there. Uh, for those who are uh, longtime Troll Lords fans, uh, at the uh, MSP Comic Con this May, uh, the 14th and 15th, for the first time in decades, really, all four of us who are involved in that, Scott Biederstadt, myself, uh, Brian Augustin, and Len Straczewski, will be together. Uh, it's nice of the uh, Comic-Con people to, to put that together and make sure we could all be there. We'll be doing a panel. We've got uh, different material, uh, prints, uh, 30th anniversary prints, uh, a glass or a tumbler that the convention is going to be uh, selling and making available. We'll be doing podcast interviews and a variety of things. And then again, trying to release the early material in the latter part of this 30th anniversary year. Um, and, uh, and then who knows where that'll lead, but it's kind of fun to do new, new material, but it's also fun to bring it back full circle and make sure that the, uh, the material we did to, to start all this off is, is available again for readers and accessible. And I'm glad you're not going to uh, George Lucas it. No, no. <laughs> that, that would, I, don't know if, I don't know if we could screw it up that bad. <laughs> no, and I wouldn't change it. That's that is the thing. I'm, I'm not. We're not redrawing anything. I'm just trying to represent this stuff as I do this uh, production work on it to uh, to get it look looking like it, uh, you know, as it originally was presented. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for all the time and for all the honesty and for all the all the information for artists out there too. Uh, thanks, Corey. Appreciate you having me, and and, and uh, always fun to talk with you. And that's Paul Fricke. Um, in the show notes are all of the links to all of his projects. I'd really appreciate it if you'd go check him out, especially his new Patreon. 
Um, Paul will be at MSP SpringCon or MSP Comic Con. Nah, I'm just calling it SpringCon. And I'll call it SpringCon forever. And I don't care. I don't care if anybody gets mad. We will be at SpringCon as well. We will be live streaming. That's right. When the doors open, the podcast starts. When the doors close, I will collapse into and, and go hide because I will have been around a whole bunch of human beings for five, eight, 10, 15, a bajillion hours. So I'll, I'll, I'll be going and hiding in my cave on Mars. But we'll be live streaming. It's going to be on YouTube. Details to come, but boy, we got a lot of fun stuff planned at SpringCon. We got a lot of fun stuff planned in upcoming episodes, too. I'm kind of surprised at some of the people I'm going to be interviewing. I'm going to be working on that EC, getting you the history of EC, getting you information on the books that EC published. I'm looking at some other stuff, too. So, Solitaire Rose Radio, boy, I, I wish I had more time because I'd do, I'd do an episode a day. I really would. Uh, crazy Comics and Stories keeps moving along. There's a novel cast over on novels.solitairerose.com. Head on over there. I'm doing a story called All In. And it's a story about love, poker, and when it becomes time to grow up. And then the weekly news update is back. My news headline parody that I ran for 10 years is back because, well, it, it just can't be stopped. And that's at weeklynewsupdate.solitairerose.com. The Solitaire Rose Network is on the air. And the Solitaire Rose Network is brought to you by our sponsors, these guys. Believe it or not, kids, this silliness has actual real sponsors. Our first sponsor is Graze.com. Graze gives you healthy snacks sent to your house. You can have them delivered weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. And your first box is free if you use the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-B. Our second sponsor is Bombas. Bombas socks are some of the best socks in the world. And remember, for every pair you buy, they donate a pair to a homeless shelter or other worthy cause. Just go to bombas.gotocloud.org slash sf30. That's right. Those are our ads. Go check out our sponsors. So thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. Please let people know if you enjoy it. Let them know via Twitter, via Facebook, via Stitcher. Uh, give us some reviews on iTunes. Um, head on over to, to, to Joe's eBay site and Jin's Patreon site. And For me, you want to make me happy, just keep downloading the episodes and uh, tell everybody you've ever met in your whole entire life how much you enjoy them and that they should listen. And I'll be back soon with more stories.